WLRN Video presents Greetings! Welcome to Turf Radio, or WLRN. Thanks for tuning in. This is Thistle Patterson. My guest for today's show is Elizabeth Miller, the contributing editor of Spinning and Weaving, Radical Feminism for the 21st Century. Elizabeth is a Chicago feminist activist who runs the Chicago Feminist Salon and co-organized the Women in Media Conference, a radical feminist conference held in Chicago in 2018. In recent years, she worked on the successful campaigns to get the U.S. Equal Rights Amendment ratified in Illinois and to enact Illinois House Bill 40, which ensured that abortion will remain legal in Illinois even if the U.S. Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Among other projects, she is currently working with the U.S. radical feminist organization Feminists in Struggle to lobby Congress to pass legislation protecting women's sex-based rights. She is also organizing two other radical feminist conferences in the United States and running several large radical feminist social media pages and groups. So with no further ado, please enjoy this conversation I had with Elizabeth Miller on February 22nd. Hello to all of our WLRN listeners. This morning, I am interviewing Elizabeth Miller. She is the editor for a new feminist anthology coming out called Spinning and Weaving. And she's here to talk with us today about that monumental feminist work that's gonna be hitting the scene soon in March. Um, Welcome Elizabeth to the show. Thank you, Thistle. Thank you for having me here. It's great to talk to you, as usual. Awesome. So for our listeners who don't know about your feminist work, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you have been doing in the feminist movement for the past few years? Sure. Um, Well, let's see. I've been a feminist, you know, all my life. I was raised by a feminist. Um, I don't know if I really knew the phrase radical feminism until more recently, maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, I just thought there was feminism, (laughs) haha, silly me. (laughs) Um, And then I sort of started to realize that there were things that were really feminism and things that were not, but had that word in them. Um, And that was kind of when when I realized that and I realized that there were um, people working against the interests of women and calling themselves feminists and that some people were saying that things like, you know, prostitution and pornography and surrogacy were really empowering for women. That was when I got really involved politically in an activist kind of way. And I guess like many people, this was sort of sped up by being on social media and talking to other radical feminists. And like you, Thistle, yes, I, I, it's funny because, you, so you and I um, were two of the main co-organizers of the Women in Media Conference in 2018. And I don't even really remember exactly how we met. I mean, I know it was online, obviously, in social media, and I think that we were just in some groups together and then you eventually reached out to me and were like, hey, I want to do a conference. I want to do a radical feminist conference. There really hasn't been one in America in a long time. Um, Do you want to work on this with me? And I said, yes. And then we, I think it took us about nine months to create that conference, which happened in Chicago in 2018 and featured a lot of really amazing radical feminists from around the world. Um, And then after that, I created, um, because women were so excited about being at that conference, I created the Chicago Feminist Salon after that, which meets every month um, in Chicago and is a radical feminist meeting where we do all sorts of things. Sometimes we do art performances, sometimes we do readings, sometimes we have um, discussions led by members. We do all kinds of things. And, and, and we share food. 
We do. And each other's company. We often go out afterwards. Yes, although since COVID, that's been yeah. somewhat curtailed, but we did, we have been able to meet outside and on Zoom. So hopefully we'll be back to our usual tricks sometime soon when we're all vaccinated. And then, um, did you want me to talk about what inspired me to create the book now or have yeah, I? Yeah, that was my next question. What inspired you to create Spinning and Weaving? Yeah. Yeah, so the full name is Spinning and Weaving, colon, Radical Feminists, I'm sorry, Radical Feminism for the 21st Century. And the reason I'm saying the whole title is that that kind of describes what I'm trying to do with the book. So what happened was, well, a few things, just like you and I realized that there hadn't been like a major radical feminist conference in the US in a long time, like there were, like there were in the second wave. Similarly, I was like, hey, I see, you know, individual women like Sheila Jeffries and Gail Dines and people like that writing these great books of radical feminist theory. But what I haven't seen is stuff that was very prevalent, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, which is anthologies of many women's voices developing radical feminist theory. And I found that kind of ironic because on social media, I saw women saying brilliant things all the time. Um, so sometimes that was in more formal ways, like they would write up a post that was like an essay. And then other times it was just like in the comments, like somebody would put up a post and then somebody would in a, you know, like a Facebook comment, write, you know, several paragraphs. And I would be oh, like, oh my God, that's an essay on radical feminism. Like that, that person is developing radical feminist theory right there in a freaking Facebook comment. And I would be so impressed by women's um, brilliance. <laughs> and, and a lot of these women were, you know, not famous at all. Maybe people who'd never written anything before, um, certainly hadn't been published, you know, and were really grassroots thinkers and grassroots activists. And that really inspired me because that's who radical feminist theory was developed by. Radical feminist theory was not an academic, you know, discipline to begin with. And in fact, academia has really ruined feminism, honestly. It's made it into queer theory, you know, incoherent nonsense. But real women, you know, just being, talking about their own experiences, their own individual experiences and their own, um, observations of what goes on in the world for women, that's grassroots radical feminist theory. And that's where it comes from. And every woman can help to build radical feminist political theory and activism. And so I saw that happening and I thought, you know what, this shouldn't just fade away when, when it scrolls by, you know, when the comments scroll by tomorrow and are lost. I'm going to put a book together. <laughs> And so I just started reaching out to women who both, you know, sort of more famous radical feminists and just women who were saying smart things online. And I wrote to like, I think about a hundred of them or 120 of them or something. Did you approach the women for essays first before you approached Ruth Barrett? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, although I did approach Ruth fairly early on because I thought, okay, I don't know how to actually publish a book. So, and I kn knew that Ruth Barrett had public, you know, has a publishing company, Title Time Publishing, and she has uh, published Female Erasure, which is a great anthology on, you know, gender critical feminism and um, other books of her own. And so I thought, you know, maybe she would publish it. I wasn't even sure what that meant, you know, but maybe she would publish it or maybe she would help me publish it or give me guidance. And so um, that did, I did have those thoughts pretty early on, but I think I started, I believe I started um, reaching out to individual potential contributors first. And then once I saw that there was some interest, I talked to Ruth. And did Ruth come on board right away or was there a conversation first? She was very, very generous, as she always is. Um, you know, basically anything I've ever asked her, she's been like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Here, here let me start doing that. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, yeah, Ruth is just amazing. I love her. 
Um, and so she has guided me through the entire process, helping me figure out um, how to get the book to come into existence as a print book. Um, and it will also be available as an electronic book. Um, so where is it going to be sold online? Will it be available via Amazon, for example? Well, it'll be sold through the website that I created to publicize the book, which is spinningandweaving.org, which will link to the company that's actually printing it. Um, so there's two companies involved. There's one designing the book, and then there's another company that will print it and distribute it. So I believe they will make it available to bookstores. Now, whether bookstores will pick it up, you know, is, is anyone's guess since um, feminist voices are being censored everywhere, including by bookstores, including by- um, All right, so WLRM ladies, it's time to contact our local feminist bookstores or formerly feminist bookstores and request that they carry this book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say like the, the formerly feminist bookstore in Chicago, um, Women and Children First, which is, used to be a fantastic feminist bookstore for decades, is now, you know, co-opted by trans stuff. And there's hardly any actual feminist books in that bookstore anymore. Right. Same uh, here, over here in really that. Horrifying. So bookstores, I don't know, maybe, you know, we'll see. But, um, and certainly I would love help if people want to help getting it into bookstores and libraries and and academic libraries, that would be wonderful. But for sure, it will be available through spinningandweaving.org. And then, yes, I will also sell it on Amazon. We also see what Amazon does to writers too. Like they've, they've taken um, Abigail Schreier's book about the transgender um, craze, attack, you know, impacting young girls. They've taken that down. They've, I saw yesterday that they took down um, another book about transgenderism that a man wrote. So yeah, they're censoring people left and right. Okay. So if your book is sold through Amazon, it probably won't be sold through Amazon for very long. Well, who knows? I mean, yeah. who knows? It, maybe it'll fly under the radar. I mean, you yeah. know, I'm not, I'm not a writer for the Wall Street Journal, so I might not be, I no, might fly under the radar, radar more than Abigail Schreier did, but we'll yeah. see. Well, in any case, it's good to support uh, the the publishing company and to buy directly from them. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think women need to go back to making our own stuff, you know, just like we did in the second wave, our own presses, our own women's presses, our own publishing companies, our own record companies, our own bookstores, our own everything. Totally. I mean, we did it before. We'll do it again. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's an army of women just yeah, we're not going to be silenced, ready and waiting to do that work at this point. I mean, we are 52% of the population and the wave is rising. And yeah, um, Absolutely. So yeah. Uh, if you're listening right now, um, we're talking with Elizabeth, I'm talking with Elizabeth Miller, who is the editor of Spinning and Weaving, a radical feminist anthology that's coming out soon. When is the book scheduled to come out? It's scheduled to come out in March. Um, Ruth and I had talked about March 21st because that's an auspicious date. Um, I'm, ho I'm hoping that it may still come out by the 21st. It has, um, I know one thing you, we're going to maybe ask me about was any obstacles to getting the book published. And one thing is that um, it's still in the design process because um, there's been more work. The designer has found that there was more formatting work to do than anticipated. Because, and I think that's because um, women contributed to it from many different countries. And a lot of them didn't use Microsoft Word you know, they use free software or software that was available in their countries. And so apparently there's some like internal formatting stuff that was not consistent that I couldn't really see when I looked at their documents. But I guess from a book design perspective, there's some uh, quite a bit of formatting that has to be made uniform. Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't know if that's an obstacle, but it's slowing things down a little bit. Yeah. Um, what are some of the major themes coming out of the book? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it really covers 
let, let's start with how the essays came into being. So I, when I reached out to women, I tried to make it pretty open-ended because I didn't want to sort of be, you know, I didn't want it to be hierarchical. I didn't want it to be like, I'm in charge and I will tell you what to think about and say. I wanted it to be the opposite from the ground up. So I reached out to women and I said, you know, I'm going to put together a book on radical feminist theory. Would you like to contribute? And then they got to cho choose what they wrote about. Um, and so it turned out that there was, you know, a distribution of topics. Yeah, so the book is broken down. I eventually broke it into sections and the sections were formed based on what I received from women. So there's a section called Foundational Radical Feminist Theory for the 21st Century, which is kind of foundational radical feminist theory. It's kind of overarching um, and not so much focused on one particular topic within radical feminism. Then there's a section on intersectional feminism. Then there's a section on pornography and prostitution as oppression of women. Next section is lesbian radical feminism. Then there's women's sexuality as a radical feminist issue. Then online exploitation and oppression of women. Then transgender politics and the men's sexual rights movement. And then um, radical feminist fiction, poetry, plays, memoir, and literary analysis. So wow. those are the sections of the book. How many contributing authors are there? I believe there were 37. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And what do you hope this book will do for our feminist movement? What, why is it feminist theory? What makes it feminist theory for the 21st century specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, because it's being written now, it's being written in the climate that we're in and it's responding to what is happening in the world and specifically for women. Um, and so it's for the 21st century because I think part of the, my goal was to um, help women frame for themselves mentally, um, you know, how to deal with the world, how to deal with what's being thrown at us and how to understand it and how to see individual experiences that we're having as part of a large umbrella of women's oppression and the way that our oppression is playing out in this particular historical moment. You are listening to WLRN. Yeah. Which is, you know, which has a lot in common with how it's played out in previous historical moments and a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you, one sort of depressing thing is if you read things from the 70s or the 80s or the 1880s, <laughs> you see a lot of the same things, like a lot of the same ways that men try to silence women, try to control women, try to prevent women from accessing things like education and political power and the vote and economic um, power, economic power how men try to keep women, you know, confined to the home and to serving men. Um, a lot of that is still going on, hasn't changed profoundly and just is playing out in a different way. I mean, I, you know, we've made some strides, but I mean, I think one really good illustration of how much this stuff continues is how COVID has impacted women. I saw an article that like pretty much all the jobs lost in COVID were lost by women. <laughs> and I saw another article that um, women who are in academia have, um, because of COVID, you know, the women who had children have basically had to give up doing their research so that they could care for and homeschool their children. And that this really hasn't impacted men um, you know, or like it, at least nearly not to the same extent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, I mean, in 2021, right, in 2021, women are taking most of the brunt of COVID in terms of how it impacts their careers. 
Yeah. So that's something that is sort of a new way that an old problem is playing out. Absolutely. So I'm wondering um, how this book is going to change things. You know, do you, what do you hope it will do once it's released? Yeah, well, I hope it will do a lot of different things. I hope it will empower women, like actual empowerment, not the kind of empowerment that we get from wearing lipstick and Victoria's Secret stuff. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I hope that it will empower them by seeing their voices and the voices of other women in print, by seeing that a lot of these essays were written by very young women, by women who've never written before. Uh, that's one thing I'll say is that the, the age distribution of the contributing authors is from their very early 20s through like their mid 70s, I believe. Um, and we have women, you know, in every decade in there. They're from all over the world, um, you know. So I think it's important. I think that it will empower women to see all those different voices and to know that all of those different kinds of women in different demographics have very powerful things to say, very powerful analysis. Um, and to know also that women can get our voices out there. So I think that we've, many of us have been extremely enraged really by the censorship that's going on. And I think that we need to fight back. This is a way, so just making this book is a way of fighting back. Mm -hmm. You know, it's saying you can't take our voices away. You can't stop us from speaking. You can't stop us from gathering. Mm -hmm. You can't stop us from sharing our wisdom with each other. You can't stop us from educating each other. Um, I also hope that women who have not read Radical Feminist Theory before will read this. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. Because um, I opened up the table of contents and I looked at all of the authors' bios and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's all my friends, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's like we can be preaching to the choir and talking to each other, but a book like this has the potential to fall into the hands of people who have not considered radical feminism and change their minds or open their eyes to something they've never thought of before. So let's hope that it gets beyond our bubble. Absolutely. Yes, I very much hope that. And I mean, I'm inspired by some of what happened in the second wave, like, like Shulamit Firestone wrote the dialectic of sex when she was like 25, excuse me. And she wasn't a famous person. You know, she was just this young woman who was brilliant and wrote this book and, and women who had never heard of radical feminism or considered its importance or thought about radical feminist theory, read it and their eyes were opened and they were, you know, their the tops of their heads were blown off. And I, you know, one thing I see online that's really, really heartening is seeing really young women say, I discovered Andrea Dworkin and I read her books and now my life has changed forever. I mean, to see a 20 year old say that is really, it's such a wonderful feeling. It is, especially since misogynist activists like to create this image of radical feminists being these older women who are so backwards and you know, right, as if so being old older is a negative. Like, yes, right. I have decades of experience and accumulated wisdom. Exactly. <laughs> That's a positive, kids. That's not a negative. Right. But yet, at the same time, of course, we want all women to be liberated from patriarchy. And we have to really liberate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And so reading, I mean, I guess, honestly, that's, I don't know if that's the goal of the book, but it's definitely one of the big goals is to help women liberate themselves from patriarchy. And you have to liberate your mind mm -hmm. before you can do anything else. So, and I see, that's something I see online all the time too, is really young women and girls, you know, teenage girls even saying, um, I spent my life like absorbing these horrible misogynistic messages about what women are and should be and what women can and can't do and, sh and must do. And I, it always made me feel awful, like in my gut, but I had to accept it because that was the only message available to me. 
until, <laughs> you know, I went on Reddit or over it or wherever. And I saw people say, you know, or I heard people saying, oh, these horrible turfs, they want to kill everyone. And I was like, what are turfs? And then I was like, I'm going to go read some of their horrible, hateful messages. And then I read them and I was like, wait, this isn't horrible or hateful at all. This is what I've really always known in my gut, but everybody told me the opposite. And now for the first time, I know I'm not crazy. You know, that's the power that reading other women's words or hearing other women's words can do for each other. And that's exactly why, you know, the patriarchy wants to suppress us <laughs> mm -hmm. because they know how powerful it is when we hear each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any plans for um, mitigating any censoring uh, attempts, you know, a, a attempts at shutting down your, you know, once it's published, obviously we, from the grassroots, we can distribute it, but, um, you know, putting it online with all of these other, these different ways of buying it through Amazon, do you have any like mitigation plans for if, if it gets censored? Well, it can't get censored because I control it. And that is a big lesson here. That's right. what women need to do. That's why we need to build our own everything. Yep, getting back to I'm that. not relying yeah. on the male stream, you know, the mainstream, the male stream. I'm not relying on them. Uh -huh. I'm putting it out myself and no one can stop me. Um, and I have lots of ways of letting people know it exists and where to buy it. And there you go. There we go. Yeah, and with the internet these days, we can... Use it as a tool to reach yeah. so many people. Yeah. I mean, as awful as the internet and social media are, mm -hmm. there are ways that we can use them. Mm -hmm. And so we should. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we have to, like I said before, we have to be creating our own presses, our own publishing companies, our own zines, our own journals, our own everything. Mm -hmm. we cannot and then they can attempt to censor and silence us all they want, but... Yeah they just, they won't be able to because we're in charge. Yeah, and also I think women have to become a lot more comfortable at saying no, mm -hmm. you know? So when we wanna make our own spaces, like in real life meeting spaces, and men tell us that we can't, or that we should stop, or that we should let them in, we have to become more comfortable at just saying no. Just no, that's it. No explanation, no justification. I mean, the justification is, this is ours. We don't want you. The end. End of discussion. Right. But as we know, um, they don't take no <laughs> for an answer often. And um, they can be very pushy. But yeah. um, I admire your independent spirit with this project. I think it's definitely, it's it reminds me of WLRN, you know, having just gonna say. The, the common ordinary woman be extraordinary in her personal power because she's joining up with like-minded women and creating a, a, a work together mm -hmm. that's separate from patriarchy. And um, it's just fantastic, Elizabeth. I, I can't wait for it to come out. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners before we part ways this morning? Well, I mean, one thing I wanted to say is that I'm partly inspired by WLRN. I mean, that was one of my inspirations was, wow, this woman created her own radio station, you know? I mean, and you've put out a podcast every single month for what, like four years now or something? We're celebrating our five-year anniversary five year. in May. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's extremely inspiring to me. And um, that's really one of the things that sort of gave me the idea to do something like this myself. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's truly very gratifying for me to hear you say that. And it was what I hoped would happen. Yeah. When I started this community radio station after being thrown out of the community radio station here in Madison, basically. Um, we do we have to take the power into our own hands. We need to do it ourselves yeah. and be independent. 
because yeah, absolutely. I mean, in some ways being, um, silenced and censored and attacked is sort of the soil in which our own projects flower mm -hmm. uh, because we can't be complacent. You know, if we were allowed by patriarchy to fully use their media and their, you know, their places, then we would probably be more complacent. Yeah. Um, by necessity, when we have to create things ourselves, we do, and then we create much better things. Uh, and I think that, um, I think this is a really exciting time for radical feminism, actually. I mean, it's just incredible to see all the things, all the projects that women are doing. I mean, the, the Women's Human Rights Commission, they have, or committee, actually, I don't know what the C is. Campaign. For. Campaign. There we go. The Women's Human Rights Campaign. They have every single week, they have a meeting of women speakers from around the world who report on what they're doing, you know, in feminist activism in their country. And that's just incredible. And there's just so many women doing amazing things. You know, Spinster was started, Over It was started. Um, it's just such an exciting time. And it's mm -hmm. so heartening and wonderful to see women just taking the reins and saying, you know, we're going to create our own you know, world that rejects patriarchy. And this is a way of, of liberating ourselves. Absolutely. We don't ask men to liberate us. We liberate right. ourselves. And your book is, is contributing to that, that wave that's rising right now. It really feels like a wave. We've got the women's picket coming up in Washington, D.C. on March 8th. WLRN is going to dedicate its April show to reflecting on that event. We'll be live streaming from Washington DC as well. And five years ago, I don't think women could have even imagined mm -hmm. com coming out in public in the streets of DC against transgender ideology, like, mm -hmm. like we're seeing today. So yeah, there's definitely a movement that is um, rising right now. And it's so exciting to be part of it and to welcome spinning and weaving onto the scene this month or, or next month once uh, it comes out. And um, I just wanna thank you so much for your work, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you for yours, Thistle. I do actually wanna say one more thing um, in parting. I, I do wanna be part of the wave of um, women's publishing and, and you know amplifying and raising women's voices. And this book is definitely part of that. And then I also, after the book is published, I want to start um, a radical feminist online journal. So that's going to be my next project. And there's, um, you know, that's happening too. There's in England, there's the Radical Notion, which is a new radical feminist journal, which is amazing. And I think we need, you know, we need many journals like that. We need many outlets for women's voices that are in a more, um, more developed and scholarly way where, you know, where there's footnoting and there's, um, you know, sort of, I mean, blogs are great as well, but then I think there also needs to be a place for articles that are more in depth. And so that's what I want to do with the journal that I'm going to start. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Do you have a name for the journal yet? I don't, I've been mulling that over. I would love suggestions actually. Do you have, does it, do you have anything off the top of your head that you think would be good? I wonder, I don't know. I mean, spinning and weaving is just such a good title. Maybe there could be spinning and weaving the journal. I did think, yeah, I have thought about that. So that's definitely one um, possibility and that would connect it with the book in people's minds also. Or radical feminism for the 21st century, a journal. Yeah, that's good too. You know? Yeah, I'm really open to brainstorming on a good title. I love a radical notion. I think that's such a great title. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I do want to have a good title. So I'll keep thinking about that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for granting WLRN an interview today, Elizabeth. Thank you for interviewing me.
Thanks for tuning in to my interview with Elizabeth Miller, the editor of the new book coming out called Spinning and Weaving, Radical Feminism for the 21st Century. If you like what you're hearing and would like to contribute to Grassroots Feminist Powered Radio, please check out our WordPress site and click on the donate button. Until next time, this is Thistle Pedersen, signing off.